The reason sponsors pay him so much is the moment he posts something, 200 million people get a direct message essentially from someone that they are influenced by. Even what's called micro-influencers make some thousands of dollars per social media post. I don't know if you guys are hearing me here. We ourselves then need to be aware of the influencers in our lives. Every influence has a worldview. It has a perspective. There is an underlining message. I want to ask you today, who is the greatest influence in your life? Whose posts speak the loudest to you? Who directs things you think about? Who influences your spending habits? Who guards and guides your steps? Who is your greatest influencer? Today I want to propose to you that God has laid out that great influencer. And it is the Holy Spirit himself. I don't know how many followers he has. But I know his account is verified by God. Yeah. And I know that when we follow him, he makes all the difference. He's a game changer. He won't lead you in the wrong direction. His worldview is on point because it is about himself, God Almighty. Jesus said before he was crucified that it is to our advantage that he departs because when he leaves, the spirit would come. And when the Spirit comes, he would guide us in a life that exalts the name of Jesus and guards us, and guides us and guards us in the ways of God. But what happens is what often happens in our culture is that when we don't live acknowledging his influence in our life, we begin to deprioritize the Holy Spirit. And suddenly, he no longer is that great influence upon us. Francis Chan's book is marvelously titled, Forgotten God, a book about the Holy Spirit. Because when the Spirit of God is no longer on the forefront of our minds, he becomes forgotten. And you can know when his influence is waning on your life, when you find yourself being more increasingly defeated by sin. You know the Spirit's influence is waning when you find yourself powerless or seemingly powerless against temptation. The the Spirit's influence is not there when you are speechless when the opportunity arrives to represent Jesus. When you're making decisions you regret, the Spirit's influence is not quite there any longer. When you find yourself being changed by the world as opposed to you being a change agent in the world, the Spirit's influence on your life is waning. We need the Holy Spirit. We need his guidance through this labyrinth of life. Because through him we receive the power needed to exalt Jesus. But watch this. We can't pay for the Spirit of God. You can't earn the Spirit of God. You can't trade draft picks up to get the Spirit of God. You could do that to get Justin Fields if you're a Bears fan, but you can't do that to get the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God. So today I want to talk about how to live a Spirit-filled life. I don't know if you guys want to hear about this. We're going to find ourselves today in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 21, and we're going to talk about the Spirit's filling in our lives. I want you to join me there. And when you get there, can you please rise to your feet as we read the scripture today? Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 21. Ephesians is toward the end of your Bible in the New Testament. It's a letter written by Paul, the apostle, the apostle that great missionary This is what Paul says. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are what? They're evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 
And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always. Can you say always? And for everything, can you say everything? To God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Father in heaven, we need you today. We need your Holy Spirit today. God, we are weak, but you are strong. We can be foolish, but you are wise. God, we need you. Be the light unto our path, especially in the midst of darkness. So God, with that, I pray that your spirit would give us ears to hear you, eyes to see you, and the ability, God, to just have hearts that are moldable this morning. God, we lean into you and pray for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, church. Before we get into this passage, um, I, I want to lay some groundwork here. This is a passage where we find ourselves being commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me talk about the Holy Spirit some, as we mentioned last week. Our belief, according to the Word of God, is that the Holy Spirit is God Himself. Our God is three yet one, Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, but they are God, but there is one God. It is a mind-blowing mystery that we affirm with joy because I'm glad we can serve a God whom we don't fully understand. The Holy Spirit is God. He is a he and not an it. He's not a force or power or influence, but he has force and power and influence. He is God. He has personhood, though he is invisible. He speaks and he listens. He can be grieved and, enjoy, and overjoyed. The Spirit of God is God himself. Jesus told his followers in Acts chapter 1 that when he ascends into heaven, shortly thereafter, he, Jesus himself, would send the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the advocate, the comforter, the helper. And when the Spirit comes, he would empower the church of Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 2, on the day, a religious holiday called the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is poured out over every follower of Jesus. And at that moment, the church begins to testify. They begin to speak in tongues. In this situation, it was an earthly language, which is different from other, other kinds of tongues that are spoken of in 1 Corinthians. But at that moment, they began to testify and begin to brag about Jesus and exalt his name because the Holy Spirit had given them the power to do that. In that moment, they had been baptized by the Spirit, as Jesus says would happen on that day. From that point forward, every follower of Jesus has the Spirit of God within them from the moment they place their faith in Jesus. The Spirit of God makes a difference. On that day of Pentecost, Peter preaches to thousands of people who cheered on the crucifixion of Jesus, and he preaches with boldness, unafraid of the consequence. Whereas 40 days earlier, he denied Jesus three times. What changed in Peter? What changed in the apostles who fled when Jesus was arrested but now are willing to be imprisoned and killed? Well, the game changer is the Spirit of God who dwelled within them. And ever since that day, we, the church, are altogether different because of the Holy Spirit. And we come to Ephesians 5 where Paul's like, look, You've got the Spirit of God within you, but I want you to learn to walk actively in his power. This is what we need. The days we live in are evil. Let's take a look what it says here in chapter 5, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You see, evil days require wise steps. Evil days require wise steps. He calls the days evil because we need to understand that these evil days have an evil architect. See, in chapter 2, Paul says that there is the spirit of disobedience at work among us, a reference to Satan himself. In the next chapter, chapter 6, 
Paul's like, man, I don't want you to be unaware of the devil's schemes. In fact, in chapter 4, he says, don't let the sun go down in your anger and don't provide an opportunity for Satan. Paul's very much aware that these evil days have an evil architect. You and I need to be aware of that. And when we become ignorant of the fact that the evil one is at work in our world, we begin to walk no longer by the power of the Spirit. Evil days require wise steps. Well, what of these evil days? Like, what's going on? What's he, what's he referring to? Well, in context, going back to, chapter, to verse 3 of the same chapter, I'm going to read a, a couple verses of what he's talking about. This is not an exhaustive list, but he's saying these are the kind of things that typify a world governed by the evil one. He says in chapter 5, verse 3, he says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. It's out of place. That's not consistent with someone who's following Jesus and being led by the Spirit. He says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you, he says, with empty words, For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Paul's like, look, the world has systems and ways of doing things that are contrary to God. And these days thus are evil days. We just got to know that that's the world we live in. This is not Paul railing against the broken world. No, he's warning against the broken world. See, we don't go complaining like, oh, this world's so evil. Start being so mad like, Hey, if we have good theology, we understand that there is an evil architect. So don't be surprised when the world is broken. Don't be content with it being broken either. But don't be surprised by it. It's not to rail against the world, but to warn against it. Because Paul understands what you and I understand is that the more we are involved in the world around us, naturally we live in it, the easier it can become to get used to the things that we know grieve the heart of God. You see, in the evil days, that which God calls good is made out to be evil, and that which God calls evil is made out to be good. And we become very just used to it. I know I do. And oftentimes I'm like, God, I need you to help me to stay sensitive to things that I know break your heart and not get jaded or just get like, ah, whatever, it is what it is. The world's going down. Jesus comes soon, right? We, we can't become comfortable with it. I mean, I'm looking around the room and you all are wearing face masks. Remember when that used to be weird? I will never forget the first time walking into Aldi with a face mask and you're looking at everybody like, man, I don't trust you right now. Why can't I see your face? Now we walk in like, oh, you, you're, you're a surgical masker. Oh, you're, you're, a, you're a shield person, right? You're a KN95-er. Oh, I like how your mask matches your shoes, right? Like, it's not weird anymore. We're used to it. But, like, you ever think about, like, we shouldn't be used to this. Like, this should be weird. There's a pandemic. It's bad. But even something that has literally changed our world over the last 12 months has now become normalized, let alone the sinful world we've lived in from the day of our birth. See, evil days require, evil, require wise steps. Otherwise, we just conform to it. And the seductions of the world are both overt and subtle, right? There are clear things that oppose the will and ways of God. But there is a subtlety, though, that still exists in our world where there's just world views and ideals. There are influencers who might say something that just slowly begins to unravel at the foundation, begins to, to attack the foundation of your faith. And we've got to be alert. We need wisdom. Well, how do we get this wisdom? Like, like what do we do? Because that's the world we live in. We've got no choice, right? This is, this is us. Well, Paul says, look carefully, he says in verse 15. Look carefully then. How you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Look carefully, be alert. My family were into punch buggies. It drives me crazy, by the way, especially when you're driving, you're like, you get a hit in the shoulder. And what happens is when you're like 
doing the punch buggy, no return thing, you become very much aware of every car that drives by you. You're looking around because you don't want to get hit next time. In the same way, Paul's like, look around the world and be alert. Look carefully. Don't look passively. Don't don't look as if you're ignorant of things. Be careful. Have caution. But also be courageous. You see, caution without courage leads to isolation. If we're just cautious in the world around us, we begin to isolate because we're like, no, it's bad. We're afraid. But courage without caution leads to recklessness and carelessness because I'm just courageous. Like, yeah, but the world is tempting out there. There are seductions around you. So what, what, what Paul's calling us to do is look carefully, be boy, being both cautious and courageous, looking about. This is how we're called to walk. If we don't, we'll be susceptible to being foolish. Notice what he says there in verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. All right, so now he's told us the days are evil and we need wisdom. The world is broken. There are influences all around us. All right, so I'm going to look carefully. But what do I do when I could be aware of the broken world, but I'm still being seduced by it? How do I refrain from being foolish? Well, he says, understand what the will of the Lord is and praise God that God's not like, hey, look, God's like, I I don't expect you to figure this out on your own. Remember, Jesus says, I don't leave you as an orphan. I'm bringing an advocate to help you, help you walk through these evil days. And so what Paul goes on to say is, look what he said about the Holy Spirit is this. He says, do not get drunk with wine in verse 18, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so now he's saying, this is how we walk and navigate evil days. It's by being filled with the Spirit. But if you notice the verb here, he says, he says, be filled with the Spirit. For one, it's a command, but for two, it's passive. You are to be filled with. You don't fill yourself with. Which means that when it comes to being led by the Holy Spirit of God, it is something that is both active and passive for our behalf. Actively, we're commanded to pursue it. Passively, we have to let God fill us. So here's the second thing I want you to understand. We then need to allow the Holy Spirit to be our unrivaled influencer. We've got to allow the Spirit to do that work in our lives because the command is there saying, this is my expectation for you, but I also need you to know that you need me to fill you, God is saying. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to be our unrivaled influencer. And notice the comparison. Don't get drunk with wine because that's debauchery or recklessness, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Paul's a master teacher here. Because when you think about someone who is drunk, they no longer have control of their senses. They can't walk a straight line. They are under the influence of something outside of them. It's destructive. And he's saying, look, if you take that by analogy and compare it on the flip side with allowing the Holy Spirit to control and influence you, that makes all the difference. You can walk that straight and narrow path. You can begin to be controlled by him, doing the things that God wants you to do in the midst of an evil world that is broken. We have an active role to pursue this command and a passive role to let God do it within us. Church, something will influence you. Someone will influence you. Some of us is our upbringing, our upbringing, right? Some of us, it's role models or idols, music artists, Hollywood, friendships, expectations, social media, YouTube. We will all be influenced. But who is the unrivaled influencer? Who is the one who takes Everything when it comes to influencing your life. Paul's like, let it be the Holy Spirit. But with this command tells us, though, 
that we can actually refrain from letting the spirit influence us. Notice that. Like, if there's a command, that means it could be obeyed or disobeyed. If we have to passively allow God to fill us, we can then also refrain from letting God fill us. And there are two ways the Bible explains that. Paul says in Ephesians 4, he says, that's grieving the Holy Spirit. Remember, he's a person. He can be grieved. You can't grieve a power or a force, but you can grieve God. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says we can quench the Holy Spirit. So, man, this, this, is, this is important for you. Because we need to understand that there are things that we can do that grieve the heart of God. And that prevent the Spirit from working in our lives in the ways that He wants to. God wants to work. But it's oftentimes our prideful disposition that says, I got this. It's our sinful choices that put those above obedience to God. It's shutting the door on the Holy Spirit when he's moving, saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. It's unbelief. God calls us to allow the Holy Spirit unrivaled influence in our lives. But this feeling, this filling of the Spirit doesn't just happen naturally. You see, what happens when we put our faith in Jesus, there are three things that do happen. The first thing is this, that the Holy Spirit seals us. He guarantees our eternal salvation. Hallelujah. You can't lose it once you've got it. Because you did nothing to earn it, you can do nothing to lose it. It's based on God and his power. Secondly, the Spirit indwells you. There's no such thing as a Christian without the Spirit. Every spirit has, I mean, every Christian has the Spirit within us because he made us born again. The third thing that happens is the Spirit baptizes us. He comes over us as he did to the believers in Acts chapter 2. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says this, let me read it for you. He says, for in one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. We all were baptized into this one body of Christ by the spirit at the point of our conversion. But then we are given a command to be filled. We are given a command to be filled with the spirit. And that's what we want to learn to do, to daily allow the spirit to work in our lives. How do we do that? How do we then let the Spirit fill us? Well, I want to point out three things that are not overt in the text, but I know they're here in the Scriptures. Well, because the Spirit is God and we're being commanded to be filled with the Spirit, the first thing we got to do is ask the Spirit to fill us. We pray for the Spirit to fill us. Holy Spirit, would you fill me today? Fill me to lead a life of holiness today. Holy Spirit, would you fill me for this task of this conversation I'm about to have with my brother who doesn't know Jesus? Holy Spirit, would you fill me for this interview that I'm about to have? I want to represent you. Spirit, would you fill me as I'm having these conversations, as I'm walking through this life, as I'm going on this date? God, fill, Spirit, fill me so I can represent you. Like, why wouldn't we pray to ask the Spirit to fill us? The Spirit wants to do it. And he wants us to do it in order that he would get the praise and glory. The moment we say, Spirit, fill me so I can do these things and people can think I'm pretty cool, you know. <laughs> Spirit, fill me so I can, I can get that promotion and, and be able to get this money. Like, that's not all wrong. But what's motivating you here? We want the Spirit's filling to exalt the name of Jesus in and through our lives. In Acts chapter 8, there's a guy named Simon, and he sees the, the, the Holy Spirit coming upon the Samaritans, and he's like, yo, this is amazing. They're speaking in other languages. They're speaking in tongues. They're doing miracles. There's amazing things happening. He tells Peter, how much? What, what price that? What's it going to cost me to get that? And Peter's like, you're kidding, right? So we can't buy the Spirit, but we pray, Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me. But there's a second thing we need to do that coincides because we can't say, Spirit, fill me, and then we go out and do our own thing. So the second thing we do is yield ourselves entirely to obey God's commands. You see, when we disobey, we can grieve the Spirit. 
And so we're praying, Spirit, fill me and lead my life because I want to obey you. I want to lean on you. I don't want to rationalize my sin. I don't want to justify my bad choices. I need you. The third thing we do to be filled by the Spirit daily is to do what we often say of Chicago politics. What, what do we say happens in Chicago when it comes to voting? Vote early and vote often. It's to highlight the corruption in our city. People voting all over the place multiple times, right? That, that slogan exposes the corruption of our city. Well, I'm going to say repent early and repent often as a third thing because that exposes the corruption of our hearts. And we need to put it on blast to say, God, this is here. These are the thoughts in my mind. These are the desires of my heart. And I know these don't align with you. So I'm going to repent. I'm going to repent quickly. I'm going to repent early. I'm going to repent often. God, I need you to forgive me, God. Forgive me for my sins. God, forgive me for these thought processes. God, forgive me for allowing these things to influence me. God, I need you. And watch this. In the book of Luke, when the disciples asked Jesus, he said, they said, teach us to pray. Jesus tells them that our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And he goes on and teaches them to pray. And he says, you parents, and I know you're evil, Jesus says, you know, you, you're, you're a broken world, you're broken people. You still know how to give good gifts to your children, don't you? When your child asks you for bread, do you give them a snake? Jesus, Jesus is like, of course you don't. He says, how much more would your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So if you say, Spirit, would you please fill me? If you say, God, I want to yield myself completely to your commands, and when I sin, I'm going to repent and ask your forgiveness, is God going to be like, no, that's not enough. God is a good father who wants to give his spirit to his children that you could represent him and he could receive all the glory through you. God wants us to lead a spirit-filled life. And that's how we do it. How do we know if we're leading a spirit-filled life? Well, I want to I point out four quick things in this text, and I'm going to be quick with it here. But as I point these out, I want us to do something. I want you to honestly evaluate your surrender to the Spirit. I, I want you to be courageous in evaluating whether or not you really are giving yourself entirely to God today. Because when we are leading the spirit-filled life, there is fruit that comes from it. And Paul points out four things that are all signified by, by a, a, in the Greek language, a participle, a command. And each of those are, are, are four different words here we see in our passage. We see verse 19, addressing and then we see uh, in verse, the end of verse uh, 19, making melody. Verse 20, giving thanks. And verse 21, submitting. So those are four things. I, I, want, I want us to be courageous here. Because you know when that, that, that uh, check engine light comes on in your car, and you're like, man, I don't want to go get it checked because it's going to be expensive. It takes some courage to go to the auto shop and figure out what's going on. Because you know if you don't do it, you may just ruin your car. So you got to do it knowing this may be costly. And as we just discern our hearts saying, God, are, am I really giving myself to you? There could be the cost of like, wow, God, I'm, I'm not doing this. But the reward is God saying, well, come to me and watch me work through you. So this first thing here that we need to identify in our lives is singing. Does, this, does your life overflow with song? Look what he says here in verse 19. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. When we are leading a spirit-filled life, it overflows in song. But notice among whom? What does it say in verse 19? One another. We're addressing one another in song. Now, it's not like a, like a Disney movie where they start talking and all of a sudden they start singing to each other, right? We're not saying like, hey, how was your day? Like, this is the day that the Lord has made, right? We're not trying to address with songs. But what I think is happening here, this, this blew my mind this week. What Paul is saying here is 
when we are filled with the Spirit, it will overflow in song. But as we gather together and sing, we then are, in essence, as we sing to God, addressing one another. We're addressing one another. This is how it works. When I'm here worshiping with you all, and I'm hearing people behind me singing praise to God, and I'm being, I'm being moved by their zeal. They're instructing me. They're admonishing me through their example of worship. When we, when we gather, the Spirit of God is actually call, causing us to move and motivate one another through our collective praise to God. And so we together then are addressing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is why we've got to gather, church. And this is why it can't just happen on Sundays. We've got to do this on Mondays and Tuesdays and every day. It's got to be part of our spirit-filled life where we are singing praises to God but addressing one another as we do it. Man, I was thinking about this like, man, God, am I being moved by others as they worship? And if I'm not, then perhaps I, right now I'm, I'm, I'm quenching you. Is there sin in my life that I'm not confessing that's preventing me from being moved by my brothers and sisters? This, this is the kind of thing that God wants to do as we gather. The second thing he says, as we do this, we are making, in verse, verse 19, making, singing and making melody to the Lord with your hearts. So not only is there a horizontal influence as we sing praise, but there's a vertical direction of our praise to God. Look, when the Spirit of God is filling you, you're going to overflow in praise to God. Like, you can't help when God is showing you his power to say, God, you have done all these things. You are eternal God. You are magnificent, and I'm going to praise you. And my praise is an outflow of you in my life. Man, that's what the Spirit of God wants to do. He wants you to make melody to God from your heart. Not just in your heart. You can could, you could sing quietly. But he wants the praise to come from your heart. It's an outflow coming from within. There's a third thing that the spirit-filled life produces. In verse 20, giving thanks. It produces thankfulness. When? How often? What does he say there? When? Always. And with what kind of things always? With everything. Paul says, give thanks always for everything. He's excluding no circumstance. Now, he's not saying like every circumstance is great. Look, I know, I know we've all gone through some really hard times in our lives. Some of you are in it right now. So, so God, God's not undermining the pains that we experience. In fact, he meets us in them. But what he wants us to understand is that always, and no matter what is coming, when the Spirit is working in us, he will find reason for us to give thanks to God. So when your work situation isn't working out, you can thank God that your life is in his hands. When that relationship isn't working out, you can thank God that he will never leave. When you're feeling overwhelmed, you can thank God because he's not overwhelmed. I don't know if you guys are hearing me right now. There's reason to thank God. Uh, let, let me switch gears here to the names of God. All right? Because when things are struggling financially, you can thank God because he is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. There's reason to thank God when there are obstacles in front of you that seem too big because our God is El Shaddai, the God Almighty. You can thank God when you feel abandoned because you can know you're not abandoned because our God is Emmanuel, God with us. We can thank God when we're battling against sin and we find ourselves even failing at times. We can thank God because he is Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. We can thank God when we're confused about our identity because he is our creator who wove us together in our mother's womb. We can thank God he is our sustainer. We can thank God because he is our deliverer. Let me look at the cross right now. You can thank God when your sin is overwhelming. Because as your sin was great, Jesus went to the cross and he is greater. You can thank God when death feels so powerful because Jesus put it to silence. You can thank God when Satan feels strong because Jesus tied him up and will tie him up and will cast him into the lake of fire. There is always and in everything reason to thank God. 
How do we call those to mind? Well, because when we're filled with the Spirit, He calls them to mind. And so pray to the Spirit. Obey the Spirit. Yield yourself to Him and repent when He shows you your shortcomings. And watch Him call to mind those magnitude reasons to give thanks. Well, the fourth thing, and I'll cover this real quickly. The fourth evidence of a spirit-filled life is in verse 21. We submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. We need one another. We honor one another. And that's the work only the spirit can do. Our world is filled with hate, but the church is filled with love. Not because we are naturally lovely people. Not because you're a naturally loving person. The church is filled with love because God is love and God lives in you. So we can submit to one another out of our reverence, our fear of Jesus Christ. Church, the days are evil. And there are many influencers in the world. Who is the greatest influence in your life? Who is the one who leads you down that straight path? Who is the one who guides you in the way to live. Church, the Holy Spirit offers himself to everyone who's put their faith in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, you have the Holy Spirit. You have God in yourself. God is within you. And he wants to actively fill and empower you to lead a life that results in praise to God, moving one another, thanksgiving to God, and loving each other. This is what the Spirit wants to do in us. So church family, these are the wisest steps that God offers. Man, he is so good to us. So good to us. As we close up here in our final song, um, as we sing, I, I just want to say this. Man, maybe God is showing to you ways that you've been quenching the Spirit. Maybe you're like, man, I have been grieving the Holy Spirit, and I know that I've been doing it, and you feel conviction in your heart today. First off, I want to say praise the Lord. Because the Spirit is the one who brings conviction. So if you feel conviction, that means God is at work within you. But conviction is only as good as our response. If we feel bad and we go home feeling bad and we'll forget in two hours and enjoy that grill. I know you're going to grill today. You're going to enjoy that. You're going to forget the Spirit's been doing that. So here's what I want to say. As we close in song, I want you to make a tangible response to the spirit at work in your life right now. And I realize, like, we're in a pandemic, so we're, we're going to be careful here. But a lot of times I've found in my own life that I've got to literally take some steps forward to make decisions. And so we, we have this stage here. We have these stairs here. And as a symbol of your coming to God, as a, as a, as a metaphor of your surrendering to God, I want to invite you to just come forward and kneel down here at the altar and pray. I want you to kneel down and pray and just say, God, I'm sorry. Spirit, I need you to fill me. I need you to convict me. Man, yesterday as I was preparing for this, I felt awakened with conviction over my lack of dependency upon Jesus. I'll tell you that. But I felt so loved by God because I'm like, God, thank you for awakening me to this. Thank you for loving me so much. You would show me that I do this. I'm so sorry, but thank you. Respond today, church. And I want to call my prayer warriors. Where you're at, you, you, you see, you'll see people. Just pray for somebody. Uh, we, we don't want you coming forward because we want to keep that, that distance. But just pray for somebody. Join them. Lock arms spiritually within them. God knows who they are. You may not know who they are. Pray for that brother or that sister. And I want to say for you, if you feel what I mean, people are going to think, man, what's this person doing in their lives that they had to come forward? It's not like that. In fact, the truth of the matter is we should all be down here on our knees. Some of you just have a little more courage. 
So come forth with courage. We need the Lord. And he is so good to receive us even in our brokenness. Father in heaven, we come to you. Holy Spirit, forgive us when we depend on ourselves. <laughs> that you, almighty God, would not just live in us, but offer to work in us. Thank you. Lead our steps. Move us. I pray. Revive our hearts, God. For the glory of your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise to our feet, church. Father in heaven, hear our cries, God. Hear our cries, oh God. Lord, we depend on you. We need you. We need you more than anything. We need you more than oxygen. We need you more than anything. You are the sustenance for our soul. Oh, Lord, thank you for loving us like you do, for never giving up on us. We come before you, Lord, asking God that today and moving forward that we would be reawakened, God, and reprioritize you in our lives. Teach us your ways, oh, Lord, that we may walk in your truth, I pray. In Jesus' name.